It's a great pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, um, Professor Hester Parr from the School of Ge Geographical and Earth Sciences here in Glasgow. Um, she took her first degree in geography at the University of Wales and also did her PhD at the same university. And she moved to Scotland in 1997 and worked in Dundee um, and then moved here to Glasgow to the university here in 2009. And now she's professor of human geography here in Glasgow. Uh, you'll find out what her work is about, but broadly speaking, it's about the relationship between mental health and place. And what's uh, Professor Parr has had a really, or is continuing, a really interesting research career, which involves developing research methodologies that enable her to, to reach and interact with vulnerable people who otherwise would fall outside the, the net, if that's the right metaphor, of academic research. And she's done that to extremely good effect. So she's her famous work on geographies of missing persons uh, used the, uh, the techniques that she developed and rightly won many awards. More recently, she's looked at the impact of the COVID pandemic on people who already had mental health issues. And now she's working, she's on a, 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 a research council funded grant to look at seasonal affective disorders. And that is part of the talk that she's going to give today, which is why we should think about the relationship between climate change and mental health in Scotland. So I'll hand over to you, Hester, to, to tell us. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? At the back, yep, yeah. great. Um, well, thank you very much for that nice introduction and thanks for the uh, invitation. I am a little bit daunted, but I've had a very friend friendly welcome tonight. So hopefully we'll have a lovely evening together. Now, I'm also going to um, start by apologising for the clear fraud at work. And I don't know if anybody saw the photograph that was circulated alongside my talk, but it's about 10 years old. So I have less grey hair in that photo, but it is my best photo. So I I kind of still punt it out there. Um, so anyway, we're not here to talk about my photo. Uh, we are here to talk about my question. Why should we think about the relationship between uh, climate change and mental health in Scotland? And hopefully tonight I'll try and speak to why that thematic in general is important via a series of sub-questions um, that I have there on the slide where I talk about what and where are the links between climate change and mental health? And what philosophy and geography have to do with that? Slip that in because I am a geographer. Um, and then I'll end by talking a bit more specifically um, about Scotland and the climatic and policy challenges that we might face in our national context. Now, afterwards, I hope that we'll have an interesting uh, discussion rather than you asking me all the questions. It's a really, I suppose it's a bit of a new area of interest to me. And, and as academics, I think in general, although there is a body of work out here, we're still kind of getting to grips with understanding all of the implications here. So I'm gonna be brave and say, I don't think there's any experts in the room, might be wrong, hope so, <laughs> hope not. Uh, but, um, and, and myself included, but I think it is important to speak back to my title that we should be thinking and talking about this issue um, in our personal lives, in our professional lives and in spaces like this. And hopefully you'll agree by the end of um, my talk. So um, we know that anthropomorphic, human-led climate change is happening now from research on earth system science. And we know that partly because it's represented to us in the media, and it's also represented by various policy-led interventions. Now I'm gonna do my talk tonight. I'm gonna to speak from the position that assumes that we all accept 
in this room that human-led climate change is happening and it's real. And I'm making the assumption that everybody in the audience understands that. Now, that might be a bit of an assumption, but I am going to speak from that perspective. I'm not actually going to be using too much data about climate change itself, but I'm going to think about the implications of that data for human beings. And we are increasingly seeing concern about the relationship between climate change and mental health in the media. Even Holly Willoughby was on, when she was on Breakfast TV, was on this story. And if Holly's talking about it, then maybe we should be talking about it in spaces uh, like this, in the university and with our interested uh, publics. Now, at the very outset, it might be useful to think about the terms that we're using when we reference mental health. And we might actually be talking about very different things. Are we actually talking about poor mental health, diagnosed mental illness, or are we actually referring to well-being or our emotional state? And when we discuss emotions, are we thinking of those things as just sort of subcategories or sub expressions of mental health or mental illness? Or can we discuss feelings as important and complex phenomena in their own right and as vehicles to shape social and spatial life? Now, I think all of the above is relevant in this field, and I'll try and make clear how I'm using this language as I go through different parts of the talk. But it might be helpful to uh, start with the World Health Organization and their definition of mental health, which they define as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential, can cope with the stresses of life, and can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to their community. And in general and broad terms then, why are we concerned with that association between climate change and mental health? Well, it is partly because those global organizations that are there to set standards and be barometers of human health, they're concerned about it. And as the World Health Organization stated in their 2022 briefing report, they state climate change is increasingly having stronger and longer lasting impacts on people which can directly and indirectly affect their mental health and psychosocial well-being. And we know to some extent that uh, mental health has environmental, social and economic determinants. So where we live, how we live, how much money we have, um, our health, uh, who we know, whether we've got strong social support and family connections, all of those things impact and shape our mental health. And the World Health Organization says that those determinants are negatively affected by climate change and in ways that uh, make some more vulnerable than others. Normally those with less, those who live in poverty, those who live in precarious environments or social situations, or indeed those with existing mental ill health conditions. Now, uh, the World Health Organization, who is unequivocal that climate change is a growing global crisis, and they cite acute, haz uh, acute hazards like uh, hurricanes, floods, uh, wildfires, as well as slower onset threats, such as ecosystem change, food and water insecurity, and the loss of place and culture, as all having a bearing on mental global mental health. So in their graphic here, we can see that they represent climate change hazards and environmental threats on the left-hand side of the screen there, um, such as extreme heat, uh, floods, storms, droughts, fire, and threats such as deforestation, extinction, pollution, loss of biodiversity, they're all related to direct impacts where livelihood, human livelihoods could be lost, there may be property damage, there may be related conflicts, there could be migrations, 
which incrementally, if these are repeated exposures to those kinds of hazards, can lead to mental ill health conditions like trauma, PTSD or depression and anxiety, which may be clinically significant alongside a range of emotional difficulties or mentally unhealthy behaviours like alcohol and substance abuse. Clearly, those kinds of things will have a geography. There will be people who are more at risk uh, in the places that are seeing extreme heat and sea rise, wildfires, and so on. And they are suffering direct impacts there. Um, and there are those, obviously, those parts of the world, and this is represented on the, the diagram, who may have increasing awareness of those changes. They may be witnessing those changes. Perhaps they're witnessing it for their next door neighbor on their doorstep, or perhaps they are elsewhere, but they're seeing these changes through our mediatized world. And so global publics have an awareness of uh, climate change, and they can be significantly impacted by a range of negative eco-emotions, uh, and the World Health Organization is acknowledging that. So globally, we're not all the same. How we will be impacted, directly or indirectly, by climate change will relate to who we are, and our gender is important, our ethnicity, our social and economic and health status is important, our age, and of course, where we live. And whether we are in a flood zone or a water stressed region or a conflict zone or a remote community. So let's think about where is affected. While we are all affected or going to be affected by climate change, it has been suggested by that low and middle income countries are going to be more affected, despite the fact that they have historically emitted low levels of greenhouse gases, they may be more impacted than other, um, other nations. And partly due to the fact that their indigenous people may be more likely to define their own well-being in terms of harmony with the natural environments. And those natural environments are being significantly disrupted by climate change. So they may be more strongly affected by the loss of even small amounts of land or wildfire by wildfire or other kind of climate related impacts. Those people that are forced to migrate due to climate change are clearly going to be more vulnerable um, than those that do not. And that can involve a range of people and places in all countries. 30 years ago, I was actually in... Um, New Zealand, um, and I was a, a, a sort of work placement at Auckland University, and Gerard Diamond, who's an, an uh, anthropologist, came to give a talk there. And he was giving a talk 30 years ago about climate change and, and speculating that Australia was likely to be the first continent evacuated of human beings in a climate change era. Now, at the time, I thought that was a bit of apocalyptic hyperbole. Um, but now, I think it might not be such a strange claim if we cast forward hundreds and hundreds of years. Any single one factor is not going to determine our individual or collective vulnerability. It is the case of different kinds of vulnerability factors often interacting and the effects being multiplied and that impacting on, uh, on populations in general and certainly on population mental health indicators as well as, well as special groups and individuals. Now if we think about where in the context of the climate change and mental health, I just want to highlight the work of Ashley Consolo who's a very famous researcher in this area and has walked, worked for many years in Arctic Canada and Labrador, which is a, a polar and subarctic geographical and cultural region of the east of Canada. And Labrador is one of the fastest warming places on the planet um, and the fastest warming place in Canada. And the climate there has warmed almost four times faster than the global average. And the temperatures have already surpassed the 1.5 average temperature increase that the rest of the world is identifying as a limit under which to stay, ideally. 
The Inuit live in this place, and Consolo said they have been at the front lines of climate change for decades. And that involves changes in sea ice, which is a major component of life for them. Inuit are the people of sea ice, and they rely on months long sea co ice sea cover um, in winter for things like hunting and traveling. But rapid warming has disrupted that system. So sea ice extent in Labrador has almost declined by about 75%. And the so-called highway of ice that used to last in previous times from approximately October to May, now sometimes doesn't form until January and begins to melt in April. Now, research from Consolo and others in this region has done a lot to highlight the dimensions of climate change and mental health in terms of the existential loss that the Inuit people are feeling. And she's actually made a beautiful film that you may wish to search for after the lecture. It's freely available online. Um, and it's a film where um, there's the voices of 24 uh, people from a particular uh, area in, in Labrador. Um, and it's called Lament for the Land. And it, it weaves together the voices and wisdoms of the Labrador Inuit. Um, and it's accompanied by beautiful scenery. And it tells a really powerful story um, of change in the context of a, a rapidly changing um, climate in the North. And Consolo and uh, her co-workers have worked in this region. Uh, have particularly considered versions of ecological grief in the context of climate change and mental health. And, and, and she has a very particular interest in the um, climatic, social, environmental, and cultural determinants of indigenous health in the context of debates about social justice and environmental and health inequality in global terms. And, and for her, justice would involve action relating to forms of ecological grief. Ecological grief, in her view, then is a direct impact of climate change in this context. And what we mean here is that the Inuit cultures see themselves as completely intertwined with the land. They are human land. Um, and when the land changes, that disrupts their humanness and causes grief. And she argues that there's this a dis disenfranchised grief. And she means really that the grief isn't publicly or openly acknowledged or not acknowledged enough and in the right ways. She argues that ecological grief and the associated work, work of mourning experienced in response to ecological losses are often left unconsidered or entirely absent in dominant climate change narratives and policy and, and research. And obviously her work's trying to amend that in a, in a, in a little bit, in some ways. So grief and mourning what we choose to grieve and mourn obviously indicates value. We grieve what we value. But she says climate change induced ecological loss and mourning. Actually, it may not be all catastrophic individually, collectively, culturally, because these feelings may actually also mobilize action. And this is important not to resolve the mourning, you don't cure yourself of the grief in the morning, but you act upon it. So Consolo states that pain, sadness, pining, and these other effects associated with the loss of nature should not be resolved, dismissed, or necessarily healed. But these vulnerable emotions should be transformed adaptively into motivations to preserve and protect the environment. So indigenous people globally, are amongst those who most acutely experience the mental health impact of climate change. And, and this is one example. Um, and not really enough is known about the ways in which indigenous people in different parts of the world experience this differently how they have nuanced responses to climate change, um, grief and mourning. Um, and so there's more research needed in, about how these feelings, these difficult feelings of mental health effects are contingent on local social, uh, cultural contexts and geographical locations and, and regional variations in climate change and those other determinants that I've talked about.
So we can perhaps understand why the Inuit, as a people of land and ice, are affected so deeply by climate change. But is this shared? Well, these feelings are shared by distant others. And there's a, a now famous Lancet report uh, in 2001, which was presented a survey of 10,000 children and young people from 10 countries. They reported being uh, moderately or extremely worried by climate change with half expressing negative emotions and 75 of those young people feeling that the future is frightening. So we know that there's direct and indirect impacts on human feelings, which result in, in expressions of grief, anxiety, and worry. And for some people, those feelings will be significant and disabling. And for others, they might be motivating, guiding them towards action, which doesn't necessarily resolve those feelings, but may be important in managing them. So how is this all playing in a UK context? Well, the newly formed Health Security Agency has said in a report in 2023 that more people in the UK will be affected by flooding in the future. And we saw this recently with vast swathes of England underwater and obviously eastern Scotland damaged by its storm babette at the end of last year. And we already know through research that exists that flood experience results in mental health problems. Despite substantial risks to the UK, the Health Security Agency says there's still a lack of evidence as, as our climates and types of flooding and the communities affected by flooding begin to change in climate change, there's still a lack of um, an, an evidence base, but particularly around behavioural risks around climate change and also um, the behaviour change that's needed or involved around climate threat. And they argue in particular that we need more interdisciplinary effort across a range of different academic disciplines to underpin future interventions. So we have a sense of what and where might be um, at stake in the association between climate change and mental health. And before I, I discuss Scotland, I'm just gonna take up this last point by the Health Security Agency and take a short relevant detour, I hope it's relevant, a short relevant detour to draw out some work by philosophers and geographers on this thematic. Uh, and I'm not sure who all of you are in the audience. You might have academic backgrounds, some of you, so it would be nice to kind of, I suppose, discuss this from the interdisciplinary dis perspectives that you bring also to this um, conversation in, in, the, um, in the time we've got afterwards. So, what does philosophy have to do with this? Now, I'm really using um, this disciplinary marker, partly because the series I'm speaking in has philosophy in the title. I thought you all might be philosophers. I thought I'd better mention it. Um, but also because I'm drawing on one contributor um, who uh, describes himself as an environmental philosopher. He's now retired, but he's had a marked impact on much of the scholarship in this area. And he's called Glenn Albrecht, and he's an, uh, an Australian, uh, and he's written a book called Earth Emotions back in 2017. So we might think about mental health reactions to climate change as involving certain emotions, the emotions that we might assume to be negative to our mental health, given what we've already said. Emotions, of course, are individual events, but also ones that are connected and relational to the social and spatial context that surround us. And Glenn Albrecht is very interested in the emotions related to the earth, our earth emotions in the context of, of climate change and where we might think about emotions as not just individual ephemeral events, but as longer term structures of feeling that are commonly shared within and between communities or groups, or people in the same places, or by thick sociality, sociality which occurs via virtual networks, for example, of, that bring people a long way apart together around a particular thematic, like eco-activism, for example. 
So we might experience transitory or satisfying or problematic individual emotional lives, but these individual experiences or perceptions are always connected to our wider environments, which are both social and physical. And those relations, of course, are quite dynamic. And emotions around this do things in relation to our physical and social environments. And one way in which emotions do things is that they connect people. So emotions are often involved when we join collectives or emotions help make collectives appear. And I'm using a, a phrase here from um, a thinker called Sara Ahmed, for anybody who, uh, who knows this work. Emotions make collectives appear. So when groups of people come together, energized, for example, by their def uh, emotive defense of a site, a place, an ecosystem, they're moved to do things together. And the word emotion comes from the Latin emovere, which I've probably pronounced completely wrong. Um, but it's about moving. Emotions move us to do things. So this provides us with a small snapshot of how some people are thinking about climate relation related feelings and emotions in this context. And there are a range of positive and negative emotions that may implicate our mental health. Now I'm gonna use some uh, big academic terms here. So there's a big word warning, um, but I'll come out of this in a moment. In his book, um, Albrecht writes about psychotraumatic emotion, which is another sort of term he's using for earth emotion. And the psychotraumatic in the Anthropocene, which is another big word, but also a controversial term referring to the current geologic era when humans are dominating the earth, the environment and the climate. So his take on earth emotions are specifically contextualized by this moment, the Anthropocene, the human influenced geologic era. And famously now, um, Albrecht discusses solastalgia. This is a term he invents, solastalgia, which he refers to as a form of psychological and existential distress connected to the earth, and particularly the pain caused by the loss of solace or a sense of desolation connected to the state of one's home or territory. And this is a concept that's related to the lived experience of negative environmental change, attacks on one sense of place. And he's referring to a, a, a chronic condition, the gradual erosion of identity and a sense of belonging connected with particular places that are under attack from climate change. So nostalgia, he says, is different from nostalgia because this is a kind of homesickness you get when you're still in your own environment. And there we have a, a connection with Consolo's work, who also uses Albrecht when she talks about the life of the Inuit. In some ways, um, you might argue that this author has built philosophical reflection on the back of disaster mental health literature, what happened after environmental hazards, for example. And that work's been around um, for some time. That literature tends to look at questions of human capacity, their resilience and trauma after um, events like earthquakes or tsunamis. But Albrecht's is a more kind of holistic vision. And in recent years, he's expanded his vocabulary to try and get at this human experience. Um, and his claims for conceptualizing Earth emotions in this book, mainly what he does here is advance a new kind of language, which essentially comprises a linguistic philosophy of human mental health that extends that core concept of uh, psychotraumatic emotion. Now, inventing a new language or a dictionary of emotional states in relation to climate change is clearly one way in which we might approach mental health. But there are lots of critical comments about that. What, what does it do? Um, and whether this is helpful in trying to understand what's at stake for the human psyche and human feelings. His overall arguments uh, have culminated in a key claim that these complicated human feelings as a result that arise as a result of anthropomorphic 
health relationships between mind and body and earth will give uh, way to a new age, a new era, or a new generation of people, and he calls them Generation S, Generation Symbiocene. I hope I pronounced, uh, uh, pronounced that right. Um, who will live in a better symbiosis with the planet and better balance their Earth emotions, which are so out of kilter now in the present anthropomorphic era. Um, so the negative emotions of today's relationship with climate change and mental health will fuel, in his vision, this new generation S who will act environmentally, fueled by those feelings. And it's a kind of utopian vision, but he's arguing that Gen, Gen S should hope to live in kind of more localized, community-owned, decentralized uh, way with decentralized energy resources and symbiotic food systems and better interconnected health with the planet. That's the vision. So does that kind of theorizing about feelings really relate to what's going on out there? Well, that academic effort is a bit wordy, but the need to discuss and share and confront emotion isn't just the preserve of philosophers. Indeed, there's been real fascinating attention to and public projects about the feelings, actually just not of um, anyone, but actually of earth scientists themselves. Those people who are most intimately connected with climate change data. These are experts across the world who understand more than most people the implications of what climate data tells us about the earth's future. And there's been a growing realization that the very difficult emotions involved in being a climate scientist with a call to acknowledge, you know, they, these are very privileged um, people in, in many ways, but they're also a uniquely vulnerable group because they have greater insight than most of us. Um, the, this group may need some sort of professional support or training as to how to manage their feelings around the data that they collect. Now, one very beautiful uh, but disturbing project um, that's emerged around this is the Is This How You Feel project, which has been around for a few years now, but it seeks and collects letters that are written by climate scientists, which express their emotions and feelings and their mental health struggles around climate change. Um, they also speak these letters of grief and loss, but also hope. Um, as they deal with Earth system data, which reliably indicate the coming changes to our planet. So there's an absolutely fascinating website there and the letters you can click on and go into them. They're all handwritten letters, most of them. Um, so it's a really fascinating thing to follow up after the lecture if you're, you're interested. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit niche, but it's very kind of revealing of some of the things that we're sort of talking about. Now, I'm going to stick with my relevant detour for a little bit longer, and I'm going to discuss, switch away from uh, philosophy, and I'm just going to discuss briefly um, my own work as a geographer. And I do this reminding you that the Health Security Agency said that there's a lack of evidence uh, around behavioral context to climate change and mental health, and a lack of evidence around behavioral interventions. Now, I'm a social and cultural geographer, depending on who I'm talking to. But tonight, I'm a social and cultural geographer, and I've done research, as was said at the beginning, with uh, on connections between people with mental ill health conditions and place, and I've done that for many years. And that's taken me in some absolutely fascinating and diverse um, directions. But in general, I work with people in a qualitative research design, and I tend to treat people with mental health, ill health conditions as experts by experience, um, and consider different facets of their relationships with all social, but also natural environments and how they understand those uh, those relationships. And so much of my work, I think, has probably been informed by people probably with quite moderate or profound mental illness and what they have to say about their place in the world. So it's been absolutely fascinating uh, research, and I've been very privileged to work with that, those different groups of people. 
And that's um, interesting because Consolo, who we all, uh, heard about all, earlier, she describes herself as a geographer too. And Albrecht, who I mentioned, the philosopher, he's also worked and published with geographers as well. So there's some interdisciplinarity uh, going on and some connections in this thematic. Now, for the last two years, I've been involved as uh, part of an interdisciplinary team working with people with seasonal affective disorder, which is actually a bit of a contested um, condition to some extent. There's been different debates um, about whether it should be categorised and named as such as its own disorder or whether it's just a subset of uh, depression. But in our case... Um, we have related or collected data with people who self-identify on what might be called a sad spectrum or people who experience profound low mood when there is significantly low light. And for many, this occurs at a particular time of year in autumn and winter. So here is our team. We've been doing this study in the west of Scotland because it's often very dark and gloomy uh, with extended periods of cloud cover, as I'm sure you know, in Glasgow. Um, indeed, Glasgow is one of the motivations for this project. Um, and we've worked with people um, affected by seasonal affective disorder via survey. We've got 350 responses from uh, lots of different places, but who've given us really detailed responses in, in the survey. We've done some in-depth interviews. And we've had a series of specially designed winter workshops that we ran last year in 2002 to 23. Um, and we've done this work across different disciplines. We're, we're social and cultural geographers. We've worked with a, a psychosocial psychiatrist, who's Chris Williams, who is an honorary professor here at the university, and an artist called Alec Finley. Now, most relevant for tonight is just for me to briefly mention how we hosted a series of workshops for 20 volunteers, um, through which we facilitated um, a sharing of feelings and worldviews about living with seasonal affective disorder and how people uh, felt that were um, deeply affected by winter light. And we also, though, use creative activities that were designed to prompt people to rethink and re-encounter winter, particularly through adopting new daily light routines, being outdoors, getting more light, thinking and writing about light in new ways with respect to their everyday lives. So this was a kind of creative research design where we worked with people across one whole winter. Now, I don't have time to go through all of our parameters here, but I will flag that we were informed by a cognitive behavioral therapy approach with one of our partners was influencing that, a CBT approach, approach where we were prompting people to notice winter in new ways to talk together about the seasonal effects that it had on them and share coping strategies, and even write to winter expressing their complicated feelings. Each of the named workshops that you see on the slide there had a different thematic activity. And in between the workshops, we had people keeping a journal about winter light and seasonal affective disorder in a very kind of creative and reflective mode. Um, here we have one of the letters that was written by one of our workshoppers to Winter. This was one of our activities and it's included in a creative book that's emerged from the workshops. I've got a few copies of them here. I've bought my own merchandise. <laughs> so as a result of this very rich experience, we collated and analysed all our data in the Creative Journal. We conducted some exit interviews from this programme, the, the mood surveys, and we found several important things. That people felt less isolated. They felt not alone. And that was really important in their sense of being able to cope with seasonal affective disorder. They, there was an importance here of what we might call a biosocial community. People with the same condition sharing their experience was really important. Participants felt that their future winters might still be difficult, but they were more confident in responding proactively to those challenges, particularly with other people. And because our participants were using creative activities in the uh, workshops, they were a bit more confident in to develop their own new experiments to find their own way through winter. 
They had a new confidence to communicate about their sad experience with others, and in general terms felt that they had acquired a set of skills to adapt to their annual mental health impacts of low light. Now, we definitely didn't cure SAD, um, but we do know that there's something about the approach that we use that improved the pe uh, people's self-assessments of the ways in which they can live well in winter. Now, we think that that research potentially has some lessons for climate change, uh, as more people might be affected by low light, not just those already vulnerable who feel themselves to be affected by SAD, but there might be less light in the sky due to more rainfall and cloud cover or cloudy skies due to wildfire in in other places and so on. Now we've produced um, several different resources that's been informed by the lived experience of our workshoppers and we're sharing these with NHS and community uh, partners at the moment. But we think that research like this can try and potentially address the Health Security Agency's point about the lack of research on behavioural change in relation to the climate. It brings together different disciplines to try and address what might be seen as an environmental illness, low light and sad, and the emotional relationships which cause low mood and, and depression. So I'm now going to exit my detour and return to my... Um, framing question am i still on time i'm still not too too bad for time uh not going on too long um so i'm going to return to my framing question and think why should we be talking about this in scotland why should we care about this um in scotland um well it might not feel like it certainly not today but I've lost my slides there, there we go. Um, Scotland, along with the rest of the planet, is actually warming. There are different climate change scenarios, but the temperatures are going up and this will have a climatic impact, including on our seasons. The slides I'm using here from Adaptation Scotland. The overall climate projections for Scotland indicate increased warming with heavy extreme rainfall events and we are already recording change we've had our 10 warmest years since 1997 and the last decade was nine percent wetter than since the 1960s with winters 19 percent wetter these predictions and the records already kept but the predictions based on that mean that all seasons will see an increase in temperatures and will see sea level rise. We will have reduced frost and snow and in summer and winter our seasons will change and become more extreme. That means it will be drier and hotter in the summer and wetter and milder in winter but with both seasons seeing extreme rainfall events. Now, this will impact on Scotland's communities and very geographies in, in obviously different ways. We know something of the effects of flood events on individual and community uh, mental health, but we lack research otherwise. Um, and as Scotland's Mental Health Foundation reported after COP26 that was held in Glasgow, there are still knowledge gaps relating to key questions about the direct and in indirect effects of climate change on our mental health in the UK and in Scotland. We don't really understand who feels eco-anxiety and why and how that will change, with what implications. In the context of the work that I've just talked about on SAD with the change in seasons, we're not quite sure who will feel solastalgia in Scotland, to use that term from our environmental philosopher. What effects will that have? Where will that be felt? Will the wetter, warmer winters bring, as I've said, increased cloud cover for longer, blocking out the light, increasing sad affected populations? Um, 
Will climate change or addressing climate change through policy and activism actually have positive mental health effects? These are really important questions, but we don't really know the answers to them. So given that, what could Scotland do? Given these climate predictions, um, uh, that's different to what it's already doing. We do have a Climate Change Act in Scotland that was in 2019 that was dedicated to the reduction of emissions. We have a very impressive adaptation programme and a series of related initiatives, some of which are on our doorstep, Climate Ready Clyde. Um, in these kinds of programmes and the policy documents um, and guidance that are related to them, there are mentions of the term mental health in, in these kinds of products, but there's no definitive programme of action outlined in the adaptation plans for this area. So mental health and mental ill health are recognised as being associated with climate change and connected to the resilience of our communities in Scotland, but there's no explicit plan or explicit research programme to help form a plan. There's no committee just on this topic, as far as I know. And there might be people in the audience that can correct that, and that's absolutely fine. Um, there is a consultation out at the moment from the Scottish Government on wellbeing and sustainability. I'm not sure whether that will directly address mental ill health, but it might think about the ways in which by being sustainable, we might increase mental health or good mental health in ways that help enhance or deliver our national outcomes as the Scottish Government define them. And that includes goals for Scotland's health and the environment, but it doesn't mention climate change and mental health explicitly. What do important others think about this? Well, the UK Climate Change Committee is an independent UK body charged with evaluating and advising on government preparedness for emissions and adaptation. What's their view of Scotland? Well, they think we've got very progressive ambition, but progress is slow. So we have a lot of vision, but not enough action. That might sound familiar. So we perhaps need to do more to understand the effects of individual and collective experience of negative earth emotions and mental ill health in climate change, not only amongst whole populations, and clearly that's important, but also for special groups like those at regular and new risk of flooding in a climate change Scotland, but also young people and the climate, the school strike climate change generation, those kids who walked out of school on a Friday with Greta Thunberg, they're growing up now. Uh, they're coming through the university and they're demanding action and their mental health is important. They're clearly very knowledgeable, very motivated, very aware. What of their future mental health? There are farmers to consider in the hotter, drier, wetter futures? How does that relate to their mental health and our food security? Um, so we've got to think about that as a special group, but also how that sector influences the nation. There are so many questions. I'm really interested that we might learn from existing geographies of mental health and interventions like the Living With Sad, Wintering Well initiative that I've just talked about that might help us to adapt and live better under the new and changeable conditions. Um, but at the same time, we've got to be really clear that adaptation doesn't simply serve as a salve for uh, climate change emotions. And we might think about how negative mental health effects might translate into climate action, as suggested by uh, Consolo and Albrecht. They think these negative emotions are there for good reason, or they, they will have a mobilizing effect. Uh, and we might think about that in, in positive ways. So there's, there's really big questions here. And there's big questions about whether we have the lack of a national plan for a mental health and climate change. Do we need one? Um, I think that is an open question, whether we need one or not. There are lots of organisations that are working in this space, uh, from Young Scott to climate activist groups to mental health charities. 
even the Royal College of Psychiatrists to Glasgow University. We're bringing people together, professional groups together and publics together to think about these kinds of associations. And of course, those, those scenarios, those, those kinds of meeting places are all very different. Some are research led, some are about providing a therapeutic space of sharing with others and, and giving people the resources for self-awareness and self-encounter. And some of them are about routes to activism, uh, where we might act on these difficult feelings um, regarding the out outcomes and the scale of, of climate change, which is so difficult for us really to realize. There's no probably no one answer to the question, what should Scotland do? And probably it should be many things. It should be all of these things. So I'm just going to conclude with some uh, a slide with some pictures from Isaac Cordal's uh, famous street artwork in Berlin, uh, which is called Follow My Leader, but is popularly known as Politicians Discussing Global Warming. Um, and it's a very tiny little art intervention on a street. Um, but to conclude, we might uh, choose to adopt environmental humanities scholar Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence when we think about climate change and mental health. In that, he defines slow violence as something that occurs gradually and out of sight. It's a violence of dis delayed destruction that's dispersed across time and space it's an attritional violence that's typically not viewed as a violence at all. Now, of course, in, in this context, it's not completely out of sight. We do talk about mental health effects of climate change and mental health briefly in policy documents, more substantially in universities and in mental health support organizations, as well as out there in the communities and across the world. But there is a danger if we understand these effects as ones that only have to be managed individually or even just managed by mental health care services, or maybe they just have to be managed in safe spaces in the community where we can bear witness and share our difficult feelings and build res resilience for others. Is there a danger with all that? Is there a danger that we think of it actually as something that is happening, but probably by people on the other side of the world? or it's more profoundly experienced as somewhere else, at a distance from Scotland. What are our responsibilities to not just write this off as another sign of an era of emotional uh, outpouring of late capitalism, where we see lots of different ways in which emotion is expressed these days in ways that didn't used to be? Is there a danger that we kind of write it all off? If we do call for a new understanding of climate change, and negative earth emotions and mental ill health as a kind of slow violence building across years, decades and generations. If we did, what would be the response to a slow environmental intergenerational trauma? Would it mean that our democratic representatives would pay more attention if we use that language? Would it mean that our plans and policies would be different if, if the public, if you thought yourselves as potential victims of a slow violence in a slow emergency, but one is that's co currently under-recognized or under-acknowledged in our current plans to deal with climate change? This is a slow violence that might impact your mental health it might impact the mental health of your children and your grandchildren, your neighbors and their kids, your professional communities. And this is a big question, and I've been grappling with this. What about the families and children that live here who will be affected 100, 200, 300 years from now? When they sit down and hear and tell stories of our age, what are our responsibilities for their mental health? What would you do in those scenarios if you think across those scales? What will you do? That's the end of my talk.
thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. And uh, I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Um, we've got roving microphones here. So let us know they're here. Um, so, um, thank you, Hester, very much for an excellent talk. Um, let us open up the questions. There's a question here in the front. Can you make sure you use the microphone and, and speak out loudly so we can all hear? You know, people have moved to Scotland from different countries. They must have explained or how they coped with the changes that they had to face. H has there been any work on that? Has Yeah, I think that's probably very current work about how uh, people are building resilience in different kind of geographical contexts, yeah. But there's definitely that call that we need to understand more about that. Um, I think there's an, a very easy um, a language that we reach to when we talk about the ways in which people cope with climate change or these kinds of disruptions. We talk about the importance of social cohesion and community resilience and individual resilience. And those things are really important. But how they actually occur in places in different circumstances, I think, are the kinds of things we really need to understand because they tend to be used as catch-all phrases that obscure quite a lot of detail. So I think that's a really good question and I think we need to be better at answering that. Yep. Emma, I'd like to put to you uh, um, about emotion, you talked about emotion. I think emotion is an interpretation. It's how you interpret it, your situation. It gives you an emotional response, whether it's positive or negative, and you degree. So if it's very dangerous, you're going to have a very strong negative emotion. And if it's safe, you feel safe, you're going to have a very strong uh, positive emotion. So Donald Trump's emotional response to all this would be, there wasn't much of a, a threat, so he would have a different interpretation and a different emotional response. So the key word is, but neurosciences are saying about how we interpret the environment, and that's how we, we and that's that's how we interpret it. That gives us a emotional and also a behavioural response to oh, well, whether it's climate change or any danger. Yes, you get my point. Yeah, yeah, I do absolutely. And and as somebody who works with uh, lived experience quite a lot on subjective interpretation of events and social situations of course that makes perfect sense and I suppose what what we're quite interested in this area how many people end up sort of feeling similar sorts of things and exhibiting I suppose in the context of mental ill health very similar effects of the negative emotions um I'm not sure that Donald Trump's probably read much climate science I think he should uh but uh, yeah, he's got a fairly hard line on that. But yes, I, I, I absolutely agree. And what we're going to be seeing, seeing more of, I think, is collective emotional responses that are very common across discrete groups, but also whole populations as people are increasingly affected by, by the changes that I've discussed. But yes, it's a very good point. There's a, a question at the back there. Thank you. Um, we're in the 21st century. We talk about the perceived threats that you've explained to us. But did the dinosaurs worry about a meteorite strike? Did um, Europe worry about the plague, the Black Death? Because they should have been worried. In, in previous decades, we worried about nuclear threats, nuclear disarmament. Yeah. How much is our perception of the future causing the problem rather than the real future? 
That's a really interesting question. And I think you're right. There have been uh, moments in history um, that we perhaps would identify as maybe ages of anxiety. And actually, I think the, the period uh, about around the plague is actually often cited as an age of anxiety, uh, that many populations became aware of the threat of the, the Black Death and, and felt real collective fear around that as, as a possibility. And, and we can identify that, obviously, with what's just happened to us in, in our, our latest pandemic. And of course, there is always a fear of the future. Absolutely. Um, I think probably um, what's different about this is that we have uh, an underpinning earth science that gives us a, an insight into what that future will be. It's not a baseless fear or just a culturally produced kind of um, future um, anxiety that may be common in every sort of generation. This is intergenerational. Uh, many people are feeling the same sort of fear, be old or young, predominantly among the young. They've got more light, uh, years left than uh, many of us. But there is um, a sense in which that this is a fear fueled by fact. Um, and I think that's maybe um, the difference. Um, and it's not necessarily that we have to... Um, doubt these kind of feelings because they are presented to us, I suppose, or question um, what we, um, what our relationship with the future is um, and only kind of locate it within that emotion of fear. I think that the question of the future is really, really interesting. I kind of ended my talk on that note, really, because it's something that I've been kind of struggling with a little bit. How do we think of think about the future in the area of climate change. And obviously, we tend to think about the things that we are afraid of, the things that we know, uh, the things that we can immediately do. But we tend to think about them in terms of our lifespan or the lifespan of our children or grandchildren. And what's more difficult for us to do is think about further um, her human futures. Um, and and what, are we, what are we feeling about that? Um, and I think if we really locate our thinking there and our emotion there, it's actually difficult to have an emotional connection to people who might be in this space 300 years from now. Are we afraid for them? Are we afraid for ourselves? I think those are really interesting questions. One of the um, things that, I'm, um, that I think is um, possibly on the table for discussion in Scotland is whether we need in, in policy terms, somebody like a national futures commissioner, which kind of checks all our national policies that we're sort of organizing now around sustainability. It, it's future proofing for future generations. So suddenly we're being asked questions about the future that we've probably never really been asked before as a public, or we may be asked those questions. What is our responsibility now for the humans that come after us? And I think that invites a different way to think about the future and, and beyond just fear, actually. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question. And, and I suppose my answer to it is a, is, a, is a slightly complicated one. I think you're right in that I think we're always a bit afraid of what we don't know. And that we look historically and, and we see that there are moments where that's happened um, historically. But I think there's something different about the, the, the scenario that's generating these negative feelings. Um, and it's not just fear, there's a range of different emotions here, um, but we may need to change our relationship with the future in order to manage those range of emotions and not just think of the future as a fearful place, but as maybe, uh, maybe a time that we have different sorts of connections to. Oh, we've got two. We'll take the one at the back and and then first, and then move down to here. Conditions. Sorry. <laughs> Given that not many many mental health conditions um, improve very well in a situation of helplessness, is there not a much larger? issue here that the greatest polluters are the people who are more most incentivized to not care about where they're taking us, where 
you and I could recycle as perfectly as we possibly could and have almost a zero impact on um, the overall when industries, a handful of industries produce so much more pollution than the combined households of Scotland. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the question, what the actual question was, I'm really sorry. Could you just maybe summarise what the actual question is again? Is it almost not fruitless trying to address the mental health impacts oh, when the, individually the, when the people themselves, the vast majority of people, have no real input into being able to redress their situation? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think that probably environmental activists would answer that by saying every every single action counts and our collective action counts and what we ask of our national governments and their actions and their asks of corporate organisations and what they do around climate change can make a difference. It's not just whether we're doing our recycling and um, uh, for the blue bin or whatever. It is actually how we ask our democratic representatives to hold to account those organisations and, and processes and uh, industries that aren't maybe doing enough. Uh, and when we set climate targets, really ambitious climate targets as a nation, um, then we have to step up to that and make some really difficult choices. And, and then the, it becomes less a question of individual um, action and more collective demand. Um, where mental health plays into that, I think is a really interesting um, question. And I think with eco-activism, clearly there's from the research, there is a, a suggestion that acting on uh, difficult uh, emotions in this area leads to environmental action and that can be one way of managing a condition uh, or maybe a managing the feelings not a condition we're not naming this as a kind of specific mental health condition um, so I, I think we kind of have to recognize that um, to some extent um, but then environmental activists I think people who are constantly engaged in this kind of work and maybe politics around that are also reporting kind of burnout, you know, kind of emotional fatigue around these issues. And I think there's a really interesting response to that. What, what happens is those people who are drawn to act on their emotions to be environmentally um, activists, how do they then manage those kinds of feelings when you're constantly at that kind of, in that reality, almost that existential battle for to, to both convince other people that this matters and also to I suppose resolve your own kind of responsibility in these kind of longer term futures and and there's a rise I think of what I call eco therapeutics and this is a kind of really interesting phenomena where there is increasingly organizations but also individual um therapists who may be from an eco-activist background who are training themselves to deal with those people who are environmentally active or particularly worried by um, the earth's future to kind of provide a very sort of bespoke therapeutic response. And those are often outside of our mainstream mental health services. And in, in, in a sense, you know, we can't imagine that our overstretched national mental health services could even cope with the potential for, for most of the population to feel profound eco-anxiety. How would that change our existing provision? And, and what we see is a kind of informal or third sector rise of eco-therapeutics to help people already demanding um, that there is some assistance in managing these difficult emotions. So I think there's a kind of complicated set of answers to that, that really interesting prompt. Thank you. There was a, a Thank you. My question is really a sort of follow-up to yeah. the previous question. You mentioned the emotional impact on researchers in climatology and all this very nice stuff you're doing. I read Al, Al Gore's book, Crossing the Pacific, burning up an awful lot of air miles to fly home from Australia. What is Al Gore's mental health like today? And he spent <laughs> probably more than half his life worrying about this. Is he a clown? No. Not using <laughs> Nicholas' word. Uh, 
I probably can't, can't answer that directly. I'll quickly Google Al Gore and see if he's still all right. Um, I mean, I think he's been a really important figure uh, in kind of raising global awareness. And I think he's still actively involved in that. I think the last time I saw him on the TV was to do with the kind of COP movements. And I think he still attends and still, uh, you know, kind of making the points. And I think... You know, that tells us something, right? There's always hope and there's hope for the human species and what we can do around this uh, kind of really complex issue. And, and probably Al Gore is a very good example of somebody who's absolutely stayed the course and had the same sort of message. Um, but I don't know about his actual individual mental health. That's a very interesting question too. <laughs> Has anybody looked at that or is anybody currently looking at the mental health impact is going to be on people who will be, for instance, the oil workers who will lose their jobs because we're burning less oil. The workers in Talbot who've, who's going to make an electric blast, blast furnace, which is better for the environment, but it's going to put a, an awful lot of people out of, out of work. Is anybody looking at the effect it's going to have on them? Yeah, I know. I think that is, I probably think that's well recognised now, actually. And I, and I think people are talking, they use a language of just transition. So there has to be fair, you know, kind of equivalence to help people so there's not an impact on their um, livelihood. We have to move to a green economy. Um, and we hear those words, I think, banded around a bit by our um, elected representatives, but that is really the answer to those kind of risks, I think, and there are risks. And we see that when there's a decline of a particular kind of industry, and we've seen that in the past with the, the closing of the coal mines, for example, you know, the periods where maybe lots of steel workers in the UK have been uh, have been laid off. There, there are pronounced individual and community effects of that, that, that run really deep, in particular, um, local places are very kind of tied to particular industries and, and particular forms of production. Uh, and we absolutely need to make that sure that those, those people are enabled a just transition to a greener economy. Um, and that's really, and I think that language and that ambition is, is certainly present at the, at, the, at the present time. And we have a lot of students very active in that in the university, actually, sort of talking about that. Um, as a scenario. We have a question from the front. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, I wanted to ask, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, I wanted to ask you a slightly different kind of question. Uh, I was interested in your programme on wintering together. In Scotland, uh, our winters are getting drearier, they're getting darker, they're getting greyer and ever more dismal. We don't even have much snow to lighten things anymore. And many Nordic countries are facing that too. But in Scotland, we seem to have a fondness for grey. <laughs> <laughs> even in the built environment, you know, oh, you I go know. in <laughs> to some highland villages and everything is grey. In contrast with a Nordic country where the houses are very bright. People paint them brightly coloured. I'm a big fan of painting houses, but yes. It's but we can say, you know, in Scotland, Tobermory is a kind of yeah. standout yeah. place. Could we lift people's mental health in winter if we brought a bit more colour into our built environment? Well, I think that is a really great suggestion. I think there are lots of really interesting ways in which we could make interventions into our winter experience and, and of course that is what we've been trying to do in this program um, for individuals who and I think the main way in which we do that is to encourage uh, Scots to get outside more right there's no such thing as bad weather there's only the wrong clothes that that very famous Scottish phrase um, and I, I think that you know, there, there is a there is a real truth about that. Is our light exposure makes a massive difference to our mental health. But your question is really about the urban environment, and and it's very interesting actually because I think the uh, Glasgow City Council, for example, has a development plan that will be put in place. Um, uh, you know, is under consultation. Will be kind of you know shaping our urban environment for the next how many years? And I think asking those kinds of questions of our local council 
What, how do you uh, future-proof our urban environment against this climatic future? Now that might involve, and we have actually been making these suggestions, it might involve some innovative technology. For example, you're standing at a bus stop, you know, sort of against the horizontal rain, sort of trying with your coat like that, it's not looking at that. But you might in the book uh, in the bus stop, as they do have in some Nordic countries, um, technology built into the bus, bus stop, which is like a sad lamp, right? So you could be standing there for 20 minutes waiting for your bus and getting your looks from a statutory sad lamp that's there for the general population. Now that may seem like a bizarre uh, suggestion, but there may be sort of design interventions into our um, urban environment that may be affect us, you know, in terms of our, our mental health that we can design in. That's not going to be the only answer to climate change, we're absolutely sure. But I think rethinking the way in which we understand our built environment and what it's there for and how we preserve it, what we expect it to look like, maybe that should change actually in these kind of scenarios because it might help us live better. And I think that's a fascinating question. Yeah. I think we have a question here and one on the other side as well. Someone mentioned a just transition and you had a bit of a discussion about that. Now, what happened in the 1980s with causing the coal mines, et cetera, was very political. And I think even now we are seeing something, you know, with the closure of the steelworks in South Wales and other things, that is very political. So how much does your work merge into the political? Because you've mentioned green activists, but what about the red activists? Yeah, I mean, I, I not myself, actually, but I have colleagues who, who work in what we call political geography and, and will be absolutely looking at the politics of the just transition and thinking really carefully about what that how that works across the UK for different communities and people of um, different political persuasions and what are radical um, kind of just transitions um, that reflect our nation's politics and their histories. Yeah, it's not something that I do very specifically, but again, um, an interesting prompt. I'm going to avoid that. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for your talk. Um, just a, 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 sh a small observation about my own experience with um, SAD, which I don't have particularly badly. I'm generally a happy sort of chap. But for 40 plus years, I worked inside almost all the time. And um, this time of year was maybe a bit more problematic as it is for many people. And since retiring, I am now outside every day. Now I understand you don't have to spend a huge amount of time being outside to get a useful effect from the sunlight, even if it's grey, should people be having their lunches outside? Absolutely every day, yes, yeah. <laughs> I think that there's pro probably a big kind of public health message that's out there anyway about the mental, the positive mental health effects of using green space. For us, the, the issue is kind of uh, exposure to looks and, and, and kind of light, not necessarily sunlight, so we don't always see that. But I think what comes with that, what comes with a daily routine that incorporates outdoor life are all the other benefits of being outside, exercise, green space, and, and what we already know. And, you know, the pandemic has taught us that, right, as, as well. I mean, it's been that that's not new news. Um, but, yes, uh, we need to be outside all of the time. <laughs> uh, but I think thinking seriously about how we build, um, you know, a, a, a different relationship with the, the natural environment and, and having access to green space is really important. And that's a big question for Glasgow, of course. Yeah. Okay, oh, sorry. And then one in the front. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for your talk. It was really fantastic. And I'm leaving here more positive. Uh, for it. And I've been very much aware that when you talk to friends and people about climate change, it's all like negative. So there's been a lot of positives tonight. 
And I see like society is very sort of fractured at the moment and it's all sort of splitting away rather than coming together. And I'd like to ask you, and I don't know if you're getting information on it, about the religions, the various religions within climate. Are they getting together? Because they're still very important. And I think I've not really seen it, uh, but do you have any views on it? I honestly don't. I don't have any kind of insight really into how religion orientates one to a kind of environmental consciousness, except I suppose that... Um, yeah, I don't know. There might be some there's so, something in that. I think it's really interesting. In fact, we went on a radio program back in, um, uh, I think it was October, when we launched our resources around the time that the clocks changed. And, and my colleague actually was um, on a radio station that was about Islam. And they were really interested, actually, and invited us on the program. Um, but they asked that question, <laughs> is that, you know, something about the relationship between Islam and Sat? Um, and, and, you know, if, 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 you know, a spiritual belief me meant that you perhaps wouldn't get sad, for example. And we honestly have not got that. I think it's a really interesting question, uh, but it's not something we would have looked at. But I think um, it's it, I think there's all sorts of different um you know, I suppose, characteristics that we all have, be, be it our ethnicity, be it our religious orientation, be it our age, our income, where we live, you know, all of these things will play into how we relate to the environment and this climate change scenario. So I don't think there's probably one, necessarily one dominant factor like religion that kind of um, really steers one in one way or the other. But I think probably who we are and where we are really does um, connect us in, in, in different ways and, and understanding those different ways is really important uh, because that helps us to know how to intervene when, when we do have difficulty with this kind of uh, scenario. So I think understanding a bit more about why people might be, certain kinds of people might be orientated to um, difficult climate related emotion or environmental action or, or good management or whatever, I think it's probably a really interesting question. Okay, we've got a question in the front here. Hi, uh, apologies if this doesn't come out very clear. I've been sitting here trying to think about how to frame this question. To put it in context, I, I spent most of my life as a clinical psychologist, oh. and many years retired. Um, but what, what you seem to be talking about is in relation to mental health and climate change is is normal reactions to difficult situations. Um, I mean, if, if you've got good reason to fear the future, then fear is a normal response. If something ghastly is happening and that has impacted on you very negatively, distress and, and, and upset and, and generally negative emotions are completely normal response. Yeah. You don't treat that. I mean, no, no. I, I, and I, I can also remember just in, 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 in my work, talking to people who were in extraordinarily difficult situations and who came to me to try and be helped to feel okay. And, and I could remember some very difficult conversations that went, started, life can be very hard. Yeah. And, um, when you're talking about interventions in relation to this, that's the point at which I began to sort of think, well, what, what, what could that possibly be? Because mm. you can't make somebody feel okay when there's genuinely something to be terrified about. No, you can't, I absolutely understand. And I don't necessarily think, you know, our kind of, for example, our NHS clinical psychology services would necessarily be the most appropriate place. Um, for somebody to manage it. It may be. So we've got some kind of clinical researchers, which is a different field to mine, talking about this very scenario in, in the literature. What is a kind of clinical psychological response to this? And I think partly it, it revolves around training and, and raising awareness that these might be presentations that come into mental health services. Whether it is then a, a psychologist's uh, responsibility or in their repertoire to then treat that problem like you say it's, it's it's potentially something we have to live with it's not necessarily appropriate for that setting and like many other things it may be that that clinic clinician is actually enabling patient-led 
management or solution and that may lay in um you know their own self-awareness it may be empowerment in some way it may be social prescription connecting with others all the things that i've been talking about i suppose with our sad intervention is is actually that lays in the community it lays in people coming together um around a particular issue maybe there's not a role here and i'd be very interested to know if there if there are kind of people like yourself who are who have worked in those kind of professional mental health services what do you understand your role to be to what might be a population-wide mental health stressor in the future but knowing there are going to be some people within that population that are going to be way more affected than others because they are for all sorts of reasons more inclined to worry and anxiety and so on like they would be for any other issue so you're going to have a kind of pattern of kind of response across the population what then is the the role of a a kind of clinical service but I think most of the kind of clinical research that I see is it's just important you know no one no one's national mental health service can cope with you know the, the kind of potential changes that this might bring to a population um you know population mental illness you know kind of incidents for example in, in some ways we don't really know we're anticipating that we we know these kinds of uh, potential um, mental health, ill health effects, but we don't really know everything. What we do know is that we we, we apply what we're already doing now with other sorts of, um, uh, you know, anxiety and, and, and depression conditions where we could perhaps, you know, reach to other sorts of solutions outside of a medical model, if you like. Um, I don't know what the answer is, of course. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, that's that's obviously something that I mean, I use a sad box too. That wasn't actually part of our research. We were interested in our relationship with outdoor light, but um, obviously, lots of people use um, use that technology. So I think it is really interesting, and where we deploy that technology, I think is is going to be interesting in the future. Well, I was going to thank you for the. A good lecture that you gave, and I don't have a question, but uh, a gentleman asked about the uh, uh, views of the various religions in the world, and you yourself mentioned Islam. I wanted to say that uh, I have written many years ago a book on marine pollution in international and Middle Eastern law, and then I have touched on when coming to Middle Eastern law, I have touched the Islamic religion and its uh, teachings about keeping the environment safe and uh, prohibiting any pollution, um, which, uh, of course, uh, we have to distinguish between climate change if we have no uh, possibility of uh, stopping it and things that are man-made, like the pollution that we make and uh, the in marine pollution, I have written uh, a chapter on Islamic law and its uh, uh, reaction to any water pollution worldwide. That is fascinating. Thank you so much. There's time for one last question, I think, from the back here. Um, do you think that talking about climate change kind of emotively, um, <coughs> would raise the profile of the voices of people in communities most affected by climate change, like indigenous communities? Or do you think that talking about things emotively might kind of draw the public eye towards um, perspectives that are kind of, we're more used to seeing in the public eye? Yeah, that's really interesting as well, isn't it? I think um, we're, you know, with it, there's again many answers to that question. You know, our, we're assuming there that there's a there's a sort of performance of emotion and there's an audience for that. And I guess you're thinking maybe about public opinion that we might kind of shift public opinion by maybe more use of media and expressions of kind of emotion. I think we are pretty saturated with express emotion in our media. So I'm not sure whether that um, will necessarily make a big shift. Um, but I think having more acceptable ways of 
being able to express difficulty that we have in this area is important, whether or not there's um, a kind of wider public audience for it. And I say this because um, the people that we worked with in the SAD project um, were very aware, actually, that although um, nobody's really asked me about it tonight, but um, there is a bit of a controversy about that as a particular sort of category. And there's been debates in the science literature about whether SAD exists, for example. Um, and that sometimes filters through into our popular media so that people may feel themselves and there's different explanations. I won't go into the kind of whole history of that as to why that might be the case. But it has kind of uh, been treated with some scepticism, for example, in, in the media. And it's made people that we've worked with a bit reluctant to share their experience of their annual depression basically they even hid it from family and friends um but having opted in to a research project that actually uses the term or we, we use it very loosely I and mean, you don't have to have had a sag diagnosis to join our project you just have to have kind of understand yourself to be perhaps affected by a sad spectrum of feeling um then they've been more enabled to talk about that to emotionally express to feel a sort of permission and that's been important in their management of that. So I think it's more to do with uh, feeling safe to express emotion, not necessarily perform it for an audience. So I think um, there's, there's a sort of particular kind of answer to that question. I think expressing emotion in, in different ways to uh, help us manage our feelings is important, whether they need to be performed in the media um, and you know, represent people's experience in different places. I don't know, because there's, there's, there's dangers with that. If you look at some of the, uh, the film that I mentioned earlier, Lament for the Land, I mean, I find that an incredibly moving film, but it's quite understated. But people are this, you know, talking heads on the film and, you know, it's done in, a, I, I suppose, a very moving way. And th there's something there about expressing the loss, uh, expressing the change that's going on that is important and emotion. We are emotional creatures by and large as a human species. So I think it does, it is an effective vehicle for change. How we um, produce emotion for audiences, I think is something we have to be really cautious about though. So fantastic question, thank you. Thank you, I'm sure there are lots of other questions, but I think we should give our speaker a break now um, and thank her very much for a really, really excellent uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.